Hey guys, Haz here at Shield K9. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you guys how to properly fit a prong collar. We're gonna talk about how to properly use it and what to avoid doing when you're using it. So, Jax, sit. This is going to be my doggy model today. Jax is a young Rottweiler, so we're gonna be showing you on him how to properly fit and use a prong collar. Okay guys, so the type of collar that I like to use is the Herm Springer uh, prong collar. These are made in Germany. These are the type of prong collars that I carry use here a lot in my training, and they're the only ones that I'll use. I'll talk a little bit about, you know, some other variations of the prong collar and what's available out there at the end of the video. But for now, let's just talk about the Herm Springer. So most Herm Sprangers are built just like this, okay? So you have the links, all right, the individual links, which are all removable. You can remove them, you can add as many or take about as many out as you'd like. Um, and then there's the chains on the back, okay? So you'll see basically a loop with two fasteners there. You can buy them also with a swivel fastener. And again, there are different versions of this. This is the basic Harm Sprenger prong collar. I believe this is a 3.2 millimeter, okay? And then there's the connector plate, right, where the links come all the way around and they connect there in the middle, okay? This is my preferred type of collar to use. And again, there are many variations out there. We'll talk about them, the pros and the cons at the end of the video. So, when you are fitting this to your dog, all right, typically what you're going to do, let me just roll my sleeve up here. What you're going to do is it is going to go on your dog and you don't want it hanging. So you see how it's kind of hanging on my arm? You do not want your prong collar to be hanging because the effectiveness is going to be greatly reduced when it's hanging. What you want is with the appropriate tension on the dog's neck that the collar remains in, in contact with the dog's neck all the way around the dog's neck. So you definitely don't want to see any space between the collar and the dog's neck. So, okay guys, so I've added a few links to the prong collar because needless to say, Jax is a big boy, all right? So he's gonna need a little bit more length on the prong collar. Typically they come from the factory with about this many lengths and your uh, links, I should say, and you're expected to take a few out when you're putting this on the dog. So, hey guys, I'm gonna interrupt this video to quickly mention our full suite of online training courses. Go visit shieldk9.ca, train with us completely online. Everything from training your adult dog to be completely off-leash obedience trained to starting a puppy from day one, training schedules, potty training, behavior training. If you have a reactive dog, we have a course for you. If you wanna learn how to train dogs to do protection work, we have a course for you. We have a variety of courses talking about everything from um, very beginner, training techniques to advanced training methods, hours and hours of instructional video from yours truly. Check it out, shieldk9.ca. It is the most affordable way to train with us. And you also get access to our members only online training group where you get to interact with all the Shield K9 trainers, has myself, and all the course alumni. So other people that are training all around the world in our training system. I'm gonna bring Jax over here. And we're going to talk about proper fitment. Sit. Good boy. Sit. All right. So when I'm putting this on the dog, okay, I want to be ideally placing the collar right below his ears. All right. And when I put it together, just can you zoom in here? This is where a lot of people run into problems. They like, they, 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 <laughs> Jaxi, stop. They, they struggle here with putting it on properly. So they'll do something like that or they'll do Come here, especially with a dog like Jax, who's a little bit wiggly, right? They'll do something like, like this, all right? So I want you to see, right, how poorly placed that is. That will 100% come apart, right? And the, it will not work properly. The tension will not be even all the way around, and there's gonna be an extra pressure point over here, which is not what we want. So the ideal way to put it together, it's actually hard to take out when you do it like that, is one hole, or sorry, one um, stud in the hole, then you squeeze and it comes together just like that. When you wanna take it off, I put a finger below, I push on the, the prong here and squeeze slightly and it comes right out. So again, putting one of the studs in the holes there or the prong in the hole, push with my thumb and it comes in very easily. And you can see that it's in contact with the dog's neck all the way around. Now when I put it on, I ruck it around so, the chains are on the back of the dog's neck, all right? And you see that these chains are not twisted, 
A lot of people put them on and they twist the chains by accident. You do not want to do that because you want the chains to be able to travel freely through both the holes on either side of the prong collar. So again, if I want to use the prong collar on the dead ring, that means there will be no tightening of the prong collar beyond this, then I will put my leash on both rings, okay? If I want to use the prong collar on the live ring, okay, which is the chain, which is the loop that's always on top, sit, good. Then, sorry guys, Jaxie's moving around a bit. Then I will simply pr place my leash on the top ring. So now you can see that the prong collar safely is able to tighten. You do not want to put your leash on the bottom ring because look what would happen. Again, I'm going to now restrict the ability of the collar to open and close. Now you see it's, it's tightened, but it's not loosening because of the twist that we've created there. So when you are able to do this, now you can see it tightens and it opens properly, which is what we want. We want that flex in the collar. And I find that you only get this when you use chains and a properly fitted Harmsprenger prong collar, okay? So, now I have my collar hooked up properly to my dog and I'm able to begin training with it. Now, the big mistake a lot of people make with the prong collar is they treat it like it's a gentle leader. And the thing with a gentle leader, just to quickly talk about it, the idea with a gentle leader is every time the dog pulls, his face gets yanked to the side. It's quite uncomfortable for the dog and he stops pulling. I know, they use the word gentle leader so it sounds nice and cozy and cuddly, but really it operates on exactly the same principle as the prong collar, right? Except it has a lot less magnitude, okay? So the prong collar is, I would say, less easy to use in the beginning if you have no concept as to what you're doing, but it has a lot more scope, which is why I prefer to use it. Also, I find that the dogs don't mind wearing it nearly as much as they mind having something on their face. Most dogs with the face collar, they hate the face collar. They usually get a mark on their nose from the constant rubbing of the face collar. Um, and they just don't like having their face constricted. Dogs aren't horses, right? So when you're using the prong collar, you have to understand it is a pressure and release device, okay? So the big mistake people make is they're so used to using either a face collar on the dog or just a flat collar or a martingale and the dog is always making tension on the collar. So they're used to having constant tension between themselves and the dog and that is not what you want to do, okay? You want to make sure that there is no tension between you and the dog and that you only apply the tension in a meaningful context, okay? So whether you're using the collar as a negative reinforcer to create behavior, so just quickly, what a negative reinforcement is, is it's basically creating discomfort, here I'm pulling, to comfort. So I'm pulling, he came to me, I stopped pulling, right? You get in your car, what happens? The seatbelt the seat belt sensor starts going ding, 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 it's annoying, you put your seatbelt on and ding, 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 and it stops and now you have peace and quiet, right? So it's negative reinforcement to encourage you to put on your seatbelt. So you can use this as a negative reinforcer. So for instance, if you want the dog to sit, you can pull up, there's some discomfort, sit, and you stop pulling, right? So the discomfort that you can create with the prong collar is very mild, right? Very mild negative reinforcement, right? Or you can create a lot of discomfort. And depending on the context, what you're doing or what you're trying to undo in the training will depend on what you're going to be doing with the prong collar. The big mistake people make is they desensitize the dog, right? So in the beginning, they put the collar on the dog. They have no context. They, 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 they're, these are the magic collar people, okay? Whether you're using a prong collar, a face collar, an e-collar, any of these other things, right? These people just put the device on the dog and expect the device to do the work. So they don't change anything in what they're doing. They let the dog constantly pull them. There's constant tension and in the beginning when the dog is walking, right? They say, well, look, it's a lot better. He's not pulling me near as hard and I'm sure he isn't because every time he pulls, the collar flexes on his neck and it creates discomfort that escalates as he pulls. But guess what? A dog like Jaxi over here with a big, thick, strong neck and a relatively strong, hard constitution very quickly he will become used to that and he will pull you just as hard on this collar as he would pull you on that collar, okay? And this is where the prong collar Nazis come in. I know you're saying, well, what the heck are you talking about prong collar Nazis? 
every time you know somebody like me does a video there's always people critiquing the location of the prong collar and it shouldn't it should be three inches higher or this and that when you use a prong collar properly it doesn't matter if it sits a little bit lower or a little bit higher okay for me i'm not so anally retentive about it because for me prong collar is really training wheels i don't stay on the prong collar forever i progress the dog to other things all right but it's a great training tool and a very basic training tool maybe if you're not so skilled as a dog trainer but you want to quickly make some power steering some control with your dog right and you don't want to use one of those horrible face collars which your dog hates as well and you want to use a device that gives you a little bit more clarity and scope then the prong collar is the device to use okay now of course there's a lot of things that go into using the prong collar properly that i'm not going to be able to get into in this video because this video is about fitment okay so if you are using it, just really quickly, think to yourself, I don't want tension. If I'm making tension, it's deliberate. So if I'm walking and I'm doing this with my dog, I'm doing something wrong, right? You should be able to walk your dog on a very loose leash. And when you move with your dog, he is like a feather on the end of the leash, whatever it is that you are doing, right? There's always a bend in the leash. The dog is always you know, responsive to the collar because you've taught him to be responsive to the collar. The other thing as well, if your leash goes like this around his neck, now look, the use of my collar has been inhibited. So always make sure that the leash is sitting up on the back of his neck and the collar is up, uh, the chains of the collar are up around the back of the dog's neck. And again, you can use it as a negative reinforcer or as a positive punisher really quickly what a positive punishment is is the application of something the dog finds aversive to remove a behavior. Now I know this video will probably get a lot of views and of course there's going to be predictably all these positive training people posting about how they would never use such a device. No problem. You make a video doing your kind of training and I'm sure lots of people will be happy to go watch it and then when it doesn't work they can come and do what I do here at Shield King. So really quickly the collar, when fitted correctly, always in contact with the dog's neck. You never push it down over the dog's head. I've seen people do that with the device. You certainly never ever do that. Sit. Okay. When you use it, you always reduce, make sure that there is no pressure on the collar unless you intend to put pressure. And the pressure should not last for more than a second or two. Otherwise, you're probably doing something wrong. Okay, guys? Um, it is a fantastic device to use to fix pulling. It is a fantastic device to use um, in the training um, for very basic behaviors. And again, you can use it as a positive punisher, but you must be careful. And again, you should know what you're doing and be working with a professional. We do have a complete suite of online training courses that show you how to properly use this device. So I'm going to now take the collar off my dog and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other options when it comes to the prong collar to finish off the video. So again, look at my finger. I'm going to push. You see when I push, these two prongs pop up, squeeze, and it, <laughs> it comes right off. All right, guys? And now my dog is back on his flat collar. Place. Good boy. All right. As I've said before, this is the collar that I like to use. Very basic Perm Spranger Pro collar. All right, with the chains on the back, for me, this is the ideal device. Now, there are collars. This comes with a nylon system, so you can get this instead of the chains here, you get the nylon, but I find that the flex and the reflex on it is not nearly as good with nylon, okay? The dog doesn't get that same. You want to hear when I use the prong collar on the dog, right? I want, let's put it here, if I can fit it here. Man, Jax has a big neck. Take two of those prongs out, okay? I want to hear, hear the chains, guys? I like to hear that, and it's still too big for me, so I'll just put my hand in here quickly. That those chains, it means it's flexing and deflexing. I think that's a word, deflexing. <laughs> Either way, you guys get what I'm saying, right? So I find that the chains are the best for that. So you can make a quick pop, right or you can make a gentle pressure and then when the dog does the right thing so you make the gentle pressure when the dog does the right thing 
you release the pressure, right? Or if he's doing something wrong and you need to fix it or remove the behavior, like for instance, he's pulling, you get quick pop, and he stops pulling and oh, look, the pop goes away. You pull, pop, and he stops pulling, all right? I have another video on pulling that you are welcome to watch. It's on my YouTube channel. Completely free video on how to prevent pulling on the dog. In terms of sizing, this does come in a smaller size for a smaller dog and it comes in a much larger size. I believe this is a three millimeter prong collar. Uh, you can buy them in four millimeter or you can buy them in two to two and a half millimeter. Um, so for your average size dog, I like to use this collar. Um, I shouldn't say, your average to XL size dog, I like to use these collars. I do not um, use the four millimeter prong collar because even on the really big mastiffs, I find it's just too big and too blunt to really have any impact on those dogs. I always use the three, maximum, I think 3.2 millimeter prong collars, um, even on like a really big 160, 170 pound mastiffs. I will use the, this size prong collar. Of course, you must add links for a neck that size. Um, all the way down to, you know, like a 60 pound German Shepherd or, or Malinois, I'll use these collars, all right? Now, once we start getting smaller, now we can look into using, you know, the two and a half millimeter to two millimeter um, uh, small prongs or micro prongs. Again, you can look on Herb Spranger, the website. They have a lot of these available. I will have these available on my website soon don't have them up yet, but very soon, uh, mid-2022, you can check my website and these should be available and we will be selling them worldwide, okay? This is an example of a collar that has um, a nylon connecting the prongs together instead of chains. And a lot of people like this because it's just simply a clip and you open the clip and now it's super easy. You can just put it over the dog's head and close the clip, assuming you've taken the prongs out and fitted it properly and it will work. I don't like to use these because again, I find the nylon doesn't work nearly as effectively from a flex, from a flex standpoint. I find that it doesn't have near the same impact as what you have when you use the chains. It just doesn't, doesn't move the same way. So I find, especially if you have a dog who's a very strong dog and maybe has already been desensitized to the prong collar because of some uh, bad previous training or just a naturally very physically strong dog that's not at all sensitive to the collar, then uh, I will not use this because it's going to be just about useless from my perspective, okay? Now, this prong collar happens to be one of the cheap knockoffs I was talking about. You guys can't really see it or feel it. I think this is about a three and a half millimeter. It fits together very poorly, so for sure you can see this one flying apart, right? That's a, a notorious thing that sometimes happens with prong collars is that they fly apart at a bad moment, right? Which is why people have like backup collar stuff. I've never had a Herm Sprenger that was, you know, in good working order ever fly apart on me. Maybe I'm lucky, maybe I'm not. I've certainly had these, you know, cheap knockoff collars fly apart on me. And the other thing too is the ends of the prongs are very rough. So these will cause abrasion to, abrasions to the dog's neck. It's not, it's not gonna puncture the dog, but it's definitely gonna be more irritating for the dog, constantly scraping on his or her neck than the nice blunted and very nicely finished ends of the Herm Sprenger collar, okay? Um, so I don't like to use knockoffs. I know some of you may not have a choice and you have to use it. There's also plastic versions of this. You can buy like a plastic prong collar. There are companies that make them. I think Starmark, um, the dog toy company, makes a plastic prong collar. Um, again, I'll use that for dogs that are very sensitive. It can be effective. I find, again, for dogs that are physically very strong um, or that have a, they've been very desensitized in the neck area, those collars aren't going to do you much good, okay? So I really like the prong collar because for me, it's a great intermediate step in the training. I can utilize it to make, like I said in the beginning, negative reinforcement and positive punishment as necessary depending on what I'm working on. And of course, if you're a dog trainer, you're generally doing a whole bunch of things in one session. And again, I can't say this enough, a lot of dogs really hate the face collars versus um, I don't have any problem putting on their prong collar. Now, one little trick, in the beginning, before you put on the prong collar, especially if maybe you're new to this and you're not going to be maybe so good on your timing with the pressure and the release, give your dog a little food when you put this on him, right? Let him associate this going on him with some food or maybe his favorite toy or something like that and build a positive association. Now, a lot of dogs, especially ones that like to go outside and like to work with the handler, 
when you bring any caller, prong caller, e caller, flag caller, they get super excited because they know the caller means they're going to go do something with you. And if you have a good relationship with your dog, that's what they want to do, anyways. Uh, so, in terms of the prong collar, there's a right way and a wrong way to use it. Not super loose, not hanging down, nice and snug up on the neck. Um, if you have a very, very strong dog, I will say this, and you've desensitized the dog, make sure that you take some links out of the prong collar and have it very nice and snug up under the ears of the dog. If you haven't, then it doesn't matter. It can be a little bit lower, a little bit higher. Um, if you're using it properly, your dog shouldn't be sensitized to the collar. Remember, it's a pressure and release device. So make sure that there's not always pressure on the collar, causing needless stress and removing the ability for you to communicate properly with that collar to your dog. Like, subscribe, comment below. And if you haven't taken the opportunity to check out our complete set of online training courses, everything from on and off leash obedience, we talk about how to use the prong collar, the e-collar, puppy training, positive training with food, protection training, helping you with your reactive dog, and much, much more. Thank you for watching. There you go.